Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Vittorian and this is the 25th hour. This week we'll review the week in the news. We'll talk about the Blasios being blindsided by Cuomo's reopening plans. Cuomo trying to navigate the field in allowing absentee ballots to come in. And well, there's a lot that Trump said this week. So let's get this show on the road. Things may have changed by the time you hear this. And a small little announcement, uh, the 25th hour, we'll be taking a break next week, but you can look out for us on social media. Make sure to rate, subscribe, and share this podcast, and also become a patron today at patreon.com. Look for us at the 25th hour news. You can find us there. Starting with Mayor de Blasio. 19 school staffers tested positive for coronavirus ahead of New York City's official school reopening and a day after teachers went back to school to prepare for their classes. PS X811 in the Bronx is being ordered to close for a day after two staffers were infected. This might be a foretelling of things to come when school staff gets sick with coronavirus. De Blasio's administration landed in hot water, just like any other day, it seems, for not signing bus contracts in time for in-person school reopenings on September 21st. Now, the mayor had announced that school bus service is available for every student who needs it before school opens. Top DOE officials are leaving, including the chief operating officer, first deputy chancellor, and chief human capital officer. About one in five teachers are working from home this school year, citing health concerns and being granted reasonable accommodations. De Blasio's former top aide, Allison Hirsch, who moved to the DOE to try and help reopen schools after resigning her original post with the mayor, has now moved on to working for Maya Wiley's mayoral election campaign. The New York Times Magazine reported that more than 100,000 students lack permanent housing, only aggravating the problems students have in the midst of this pandemic. More than half a million children have tested positive for COVID, with a 16% increase alone between August 20th and September 3rd. 103 children have died from the virus. In Midwood, residents and community teachers filed in court for an injunction to prevent Urban Dove, a charter school, to operate out of the East Midwood Jewish Center, objecting to Urban Dove bringing at-risk youth to the center, while supporters of Urban Dove decry the racially tinged attacks opponents used to describe the students in preference for a Jewish school to take over the charter's lease. The fire department changed the name of the Bennett Medal that they give to those who deserve the highest honor because of the namesake's racist past, and will rename it after Peter Gancy Jr., the 30-year FDNY veteran who died on 9-11. The chief medical examiner gave the NYPD 20,000 DNA profiles that the medical examiner wants dropped from the city's database, but not before the police weigh in. The police have a controversial list of DNA profiles that get tied to gang affiliates, even on the thinnest of evidence, and even if there is no conviction. Over the years, even though crime and arrests have dropped, the six city DAs have increased their staff hires over the past decade by over 1,000 to 4,511 full-time staffers. And speaking of DAs, the crowded Manhattan District Attorney race has election watchers waiting for endorsements, and one has come. Diana Florence, a former deputy in the Manhattan DA's office, was endorsed by the Teamsters Union, joining eight other union endorsements. Florence stepped down from the District Attorney's office after allegations of witness tampering and bribery cases, but she made a lot of friends and support on her work on construction fraud cases. A ProPublica report shows the deepening crisis inside the NYPD's rank and file and their handling officers with long lists of complaints. For example, Christopher McCormick, who has been on the force for 30 years and eventually promoted to assistant chief, had 16 substantiated allegations against him in civilian complaint review board complaints and has faced numerous calls for concern regarding his temperament and harsh tactics. Above all, top police brass knew about this and McCormick continued to be employed. City Comptroller Scott Stringer officially announced his candidacy for mayor on Tuesday, promising to actually bring de Blasio's promises to fruition while castigating the current mayor for being under the thumb of the NYPD. When I'm mayor, we're going to end the crushing cycle of speculation, eviction, and displacement. No more giving away the store to developers. We will put an end to the gentrification industrial complex. The 60-year-old Democrat got his start in city politics when he was appointed to the local community board at the age of 16. He has served as the city's controller since 2014, and before that, he was the Manhattan Borough President after representing the Upper West Side in the State Assembly for more than a decade. He was immediately endorsed by State Senators Salazar and Kavanaugh and Assemblyman Carroll. Catherine Garcia, the former city sanitation commissioner, resigned her position to contemplate her candidacy, pledging to institute a mandatory recycling program throughout the city as one of her core positions. Two other female former de Blasio staffers announced their run for the mayor position. Maya Wiley, who we referenced earlier, 
was the mayor's former top counsel, and Lori Sutton was the former head of New York City's Department of Veteran Services. De Blasio finally cratered to Upper West Siders, who sought to remove homeless people being housed in a hotel away from their neighborhoods. The mayor moved 300 homeless men who lived at the Lucerne Hotel back to shelter-slash-hotel hybrids. Thousands of homeless people were moved to hotels around the city in the midst of the pandemic, but the Upper West Side particularly threatened to sue the city. Now eyes are on the Legal Aid Society, which is preparing to sue the mayor for moving homeless single males from the Lucerne to a couples with disability shelter at the Harmonia, forcing displacement of the latter for the former. I went and saw for myself in the Upper West Side last week. And what I saw was not acceptable and had to be addressed. Why it was necessary to move them out of the hotels and why you couldn't have identified the people who were causing the trouble and moved them out and kept the people in the Lucerne and given them the services that they would need. Marcia, I, I think I said before, I'll say again, we have said for years we do not want to be in temporary hotel facilities. We've been very clear we need to get out of all of that. Lawyers have pointed out that a New York City communication glitch evicted 34 homeless people from the Harmonia Hotel in Midtown. Even the mayor's social services commissioner, Stephen Banks, is said to have opposed the move. In order to make room for the single males now at the homeless shelter, disabled couples who were already housed in the shelter were being displaced. But the city paused that action after the move backfired. Meanwhile, the Wall Street Journal reported that the homeless population living in shelters has decreased in New York City to over 54,700, the lowest number since July 2014. Less families inhabit shelters, while the single male population has skyrocketed. Reporting by Curbed in New York shows that even the mayor's efforts to build new housing has hit a snag in the pandemic as budget shortfalls prevent affordable housing projects like Edgemere Commons from taking off. The city council has approved 6 out of 15 rezoning plans the mayor came up with for the purpose of having more affordable housing. Those neighborhoods include East New York, Downtown Far Rockaway, East Harlem, Jerome Avenue, and Inwood. Sadif Ali Kuli, writing in City Limits... Sorry if I butchered your name, Sadiq. Says that with the mayor's time left in office, there might only be time to do the Gowanus rezoning. Governor Andrew Cuomo announced that restaurants in New York City can reopen at 25% capacity on September 30th. We want to thank New Yorkers for the increase in compliance. And because the compliance has gotten better, we can now take the next step. That takes us to restaurants. Uh, opening restaurants... I understand the economic benefit and I understand the economic pressure that they've been under. A restaurant is not just the restaurant owner. A restaurant uh, is the kitchen staff, the wait staff. Uh, there's a whole industry around restaurants. And uh, restaurants also pose a possible risk, right? The concentrations of people inside indoor dining but there's also a great economic loss when they don't operate. We had a caution flag with restaurants and indoor dining for two reasons. Number one, we are doing indoor dining at 50% across the rest of the state. We have seen clusters outbreak from restaurants. So that was a reason for caution. Second, we knew that compliance was lacking in New York City. That was a reason for caution. Uh, we've been speaking with stakeholders. We've been working on this issue every day. Uh, and we're now announcing today that we can go to 25% of indoor dining with certain restrictions that will uh, be enacted on September 30th. Indoor dining, the rules will be temperature checks for anyone who comes in at the door. One member of each party has to leave information, phone number, email, so that there's contact tracing information if there is an outbreak. One person from every party. No bar service. The bars will only be for service bars for wait staff. Uh, they can make drinks. They can transfer them over the bar, but nobody will be sitting at the bar. Masks must be worn at all time, uh, except when you're sitting at the table. All tables must be six feet apart. Restaurants will close at midnight. Uh, strict adherence to the state guidance that has been promulgated. Restaurants will have the air filtration requirement, the enhanced air filtration requirement that is specified in the state guidance. Uh, there'll be limited air recirculation. We want air from the outside. 
to provide additional ventilation. Outdoor dining can continue along with 25% of indoor dining. The mayor originally said he was looking into a plan to reopen indoor dining at the end of the month a week ago. De Blasio said on Thursday that he was blindsided by the governor's decision and expressed worries about the pandemic spreading. Businesses all throughout the city have had to close shop due to the COVID pandemic, and that includes the city's Main Street, Broadway. There has been a 78% increase in closed Broadway storefronts from three years ago, with just 300 closures this year. One high-profile business closure this week was Century 21, closing all of its stores. Residential rents have also fallen everywhere, with landlords desperate to fill vacancies. But curiously, places that were hit hardest by the coronavirus have, been a, have seen a steady rise in rents, as the city reported. A letter signed by 163 CEOs told de Blasio that quality of life and public safety issues are creating anxiety in the city and something must be done. The letter was signed by CEOs of companies such as Goldman Sachs, JetBlue, MasterCard, Morgan Stanley, and much more. Despite gyms finally opening up, more than 2,000 gym owners are still planning to sue de Blasio for banning certain fitness classes such as bar and yoga because of what the owners say are inconsistent standards across other industries which also allow classes with reduced capacity. And time is running out to fill out the census. The effort to calculate the population of the United States ends at the end of the month. Communities of color are the ones hardest hit by not filling out the census, reports State of Politics, showing that the lowest response rate comes from the neighborhoods that need the representation the most. You can fill out the census right now in less than five minutes online. Moving on to the city council, business owners who can't pay rent are afraid that landlords will come after their personal pocketbook, but not if the city council has anything to say about it. A law already on the books prevents landlords from coming after business owners' pockets personally, but a new law prevents those efforts until March 2021. Councilwoman Carlina Rivera said on Wednesday, Should business owners be forced to walk away or temporarily close their stores through no fault of their own, they can do so without facing threats to their personal assets or life savings. Tiffany Caban, the former leftist insurgent who was close to winning the Queens District Attorney race last year, had announced her campaign for the city council's 22nd district seat, which includes Astoria, East Elmhurst, and Rikers Island. Councilman Constantinides, who currently holds the seat, term limits out next year. The Queens chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America have endorsed Caban. Moving on to the Andrew Cuomo administration, Attorney General Letitia James set up a grand jury for the Daniel Prude case. New York's attorney general takes action in the death of Daniel Prude. Letitia James says her office will impanel a grand jury as part of the investigation. Prude died in March after Rochester police placed a hood over his head and held him down. Video from the incident was just released this week, sparking more protests and calls for reform. Seven officers in Rochester have been suspended. Rochester Mayor Lovely Warren promised a number of police reforms, including changing how police respond to mental health cases, while Rochester's police chief, Laurent Singletary, announced his retirement after 20 years on the force, saying outside entities are attempting to destroy his character. Upstate New York has started to become the latest hotspot of police brutality cases, with Mount Vernon in the crossfire for placing a detective, Camilo Antonini, on desk duty who conducted a strip search on someone against department rules in 2017, revealed footage showed. About 2 million New Yorkers can finally get their $300 a week unemployment insurance money from FEMA that the president signed through executive orders starting next week. The funds are expected to last about six weeks, with the Department of Labor notices pointing out the payments are retroactive from August 2nd. The scourge of college parties precipitating COVID infections continues, as Saratoga County has seen an uptake in infections from college students coming back home. While teachers are worried about returning back to work from the city to the entire state, Buffalo News reported that there is an increase in full-time teacher retirements. Between April and August 2020, more than 6,000 teachers filed retirement papers with the New York State Teacher Retirement System. Cuomo announced that New York's infection rate has stayed below 1% for 30 days, while hospitalizations decreased to 410, the lowest since March 16. Reporting by the Wall Street Journal found that Cuomo micromanaged the pandemic response in New York, overriding health department decisions that wanted the state's social distancing requirements to be more strict. Governor Cuomo promised a year ago to only allow solitary confinement for no more than 30 days in the state's prisons. But the proposed rule hasn't been officially adopted by state agencies. Online publication The Cities, Rosa Goldenson and Reuven Blau reported that the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision submitted a new version of the rule on August 27, allowing the solitary rule to stay in place until 2023 if it's adopted. After some state lawmakers introduced legislation to establish ballot drop boxes, the state has started a PR campaign to inform voters of their expanded right to vote by mail. Cuomo signed an executive order allowing localities to establish absentee ballot drop-off locations. The governor received letters this week from the Let New York Vote Coalition, which includes groups like the NYCLU and the 1199 SEIU Union, 
asking for an executive order that would mail absentee ballots with prepaid postage so that voters won't have to pay stamps themselves. The state currently has 220,000 absentee ballot requests in one week, which is half of the number requested for all of 2016. Thousands of people who requested an absentee ballot, citing temporary illness though, will need to reapply to guarantee the ballot will come through the mail, according to Gannett Albany. So if you requested an absentee ballot and you said that temporary illness is the reason why you can't make it to the polls in person this year, make sure that you reapply in order to get that absentee ballot. And if you haven't registered to vote, Please register now, it does not take long. Cuomo kept his options open when it came to taxing the rich this week, after the governor consistently showed his reluctance to raise wealthy taxpayers' tax bills. Junior highs and high schools in Albany would have had the option to meet in person, but cut the choice due to budget cuts, not the pandemic, according to the Wall Street Journal. The governor said that MTA subway and bus riders that don't wear their masks or don't wear them correctly will be fined $50, as per an executive order that he signed in April. Enforcement of this measure is doubtful, as even police officers are barely wearing masks themselves on subway trains. More than a thousand climate change activists comprised of scientists and academics are pleading with state comptroller DiNapoli to divest the state's pension fund from any companies that deal with fossil fuels. The Fossil Fuel Divestment Act, with almost a hundred sponsors in the state legislature, would do just that. Moving on to the state legislature. Reporting on the state's budget shortfall has not decreased, as state lawmakers say that all measures need to be on the table, including various avenues of raising tax revenue, as help from the federal government is not coming anytime soon. Lawmakers are also fuming on New York City. The city apparently didn't use all of its federal funds for programs like the Summer Youth Employment Program, or SYEP, which was slashed because of budget cuts. Assemblyman Havesi was one of those lawmakers who ragged on the city, saying that that money wasn't used. The New York Conservative Party was suspended on Twitter since July 9th without an explanation, said party officials. It recently was reinstated on Twitter. Assembly Minority Leader Will Barclay decried Twitter's original ban of the party, citing anti-right-wing bias on the social media platform. Moving on to the state courts. The top teachers union, the UFT, has prepared to sue the state over a proposed 20% education cut across the board in response to the state's budget shortfall, saying that if the state moves forward with the cuts, legal action will be pursued. Robert J. Freeman used to be New York State's top open government expert, but now has agreed to settle in a sexual harassment case, which included misuse of government resources. Mr. Freeman will be paying $15,000 to settle the case. An arbitrator ruled in favor of New York City hotel workers who fought for three months of health care and severance payments. The Hotel Trade Council, which represented the hotel workers, represents themselves about 35,000 hotel workers in New York City. Moving on to Trump. This Friday saw the commemoration of 9-11, the day in 2001, when Al-Qaeda terrorists flew planes into the Twin Towers, the Pentagon, and a field in Pennsylvania, killing almost 3,000 people. For each commemoration, families of those who died that day read their names at the new One World Trade Building, where memorials were built. The pandemic hit a snag on that annual ritual this year, with two separate ceremonies going on. The names of the fallen were recorded and played over loudspeaker, whereas the second ceremony had families that won lotteries actually read their late loved ones' names live. The second ceremony saw the likes of Vice President Mike Pence, Biden, Schumer, and Bloomberg together in one spot. Meanwhile, a bombshell report by the Daily News reveals that Trump secretly held back millions of dollars from the FDNY's 9-11 health program, which seeks to provide health care to first responders who showed up on the scene at the World Trade Center on 9-11. The Trump administration admitted to the policy on Friday and said it would try to end the diverting of funds. Police brutality protests continued this week over Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Jacob Blake, Daniel Prude, and so many more, occurring at the Kentucky Derby, in Portland, Oregon, and other places. Don Jr., the president's son, commented on Kyle Rittenhouse, the 17-year-old that shot and killed two people at protests after the shooting of Jacob Blake, saying that we all do stupid things at 17. Protests have also extended to other countries, with Colombia most recently being the site of new protests against police brutality. But with the loose culture of curbing violence, 10 protesters have died. An NPR analysis showed that local politics might control whether a family suffering from police brutality receives a settlement or not. The problem is already exacerbated due to the legal concept of qualified immunity, which prevents individual officers from being sued after an episode of police brutality. Turns out Trump loaded his plane with art from the ambassador's house at the end of the French trip in 2018, which also saw the president calling dead veterans from World War I losers and suckers. In an admission that caught a lot of attention this past week, President Trump admitted that he knew about the deadliness of the coronavirus since March, but chose to play down the threat. He made the admissions to journalist Bob Woodward, who wrote a sequel to his book Fear, titled Rage. Trump told Woodward more information about his handling of race relations, including how he doesn't feel that he's responsible to understand black Americans' anger and pain, and love letters 
that's what he calls them, between him and North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. In the early months of the pandemic, President Trump tried to reassure Americans that COVID-19 would disappear, praising his own administration's response. I think it's going to work out good. There's no reason to panic because we have done so good. But those comments now face a renewed scrutiny as audio from a private interview with veteran reporter Bob Woodward show Trump admitting he knew of the serious threat COVID presented, including airborne transmission. That's a very tricky one. That's a very delicate one. Uh, it's also more deadly than your, you know, your even your strenuous flus. The admission calls into question the decision to not implement a mask mandate. The interview also shows that the president held back information that critics argue could have saved lives. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to always play it down. I still like playing it down. Yes, sir. Because I don't want to create a panic. The president never downplayed the virus. Once again, the president expressed calm. But on Wednesday, Trump doubled down, while at the same time refusing to acknowledge any shortcomings. It's just another political hit job, but whether it was Woodward or anybody else, you cannot show a sense of panic. And as the president propped up his response, the Biden campaign launched a new attack. He knowingly and willingly lied about the threat it posed to the country for months. He failed to do his job on purpose. And confirming fears from his critics, the book also quotes Dr. Anthony Fauci as saying Donald Trump was more focused on re-election than leadership. And while it's unclear if this will move the needle with any voters, it may sway those who were directly impacted by the virus. Reggie Chikini, Global News, Washington. Woodward received criticism for holding on to information for months until his book came out, with Woodward replying that he needed time between when Trump was quoted to verify the information that Trump gave him. Democratic vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris said she wouldn't trust Trump on any vaccine before the election. I will not take his word for it. He wants us to inject bleach. I, no, I will not take his word. Harris also suggested public health officials were likely to face pushback, potentially at the expense of their jobs from the White House if they had reservations over a vaccine or the standard for releasing it. And Harris isn't the only one concerned that a vaccine could be rushed. According to a new CBS News poll, only 21 percent of registered voters say they would get a vaccine as soon as it is possible. This is down from 32 percent who said the same thing in late July. Most people, 58 percent, say they would consider it and wait to see what happens. Well, just more than 20 percent say they will never get one. Meanwhile, the Trump campaign is trying to find a way to rebrand Kamala Harris, and Trump himself focuses on getting hopes up for a vaccine around election time. Nine pharmaceutical companies working on the vaccine officially pledged not to speed up the production of the vaccine until their trials proved it was safe. AstraZeneca, one of those companies, paused their clinical trials due to an unexplained potential illness in a volunteer in the UK. India surpassed Brazil as the world's number two coronavirus hotspot, with the US still currently number one. Contact tracers have traced 266,000 COVID cases just from the Sturgis motorcycle rally that brought in 460,000 bikers through South Dakota on August 7th to August 16th. A recent CDC study found that COVID-stricken adults were around two times as likely to say they ate at a restaurant in the two weeks before they got sick. The Washington Post's Erica Werner and Jeff Stein reported that White House aides were looking into more executive actions for the president to sign relating to COVID relief in a push to make the president look more decisive about the virus before the election. The man who the public trusts with COVID information, Dr. Anthony Fauci, has been muzzled by the Health and Human Services Agency, political Sarah Overmall reported. Fauci publicly disagreed with Trump on the subject of turning around the pandemic, saying that the fall can get worse if Americans get complacent. Political's Dan Diamond also reported that Trump officials have interfered with weekly CDC reports, editing language in order to soften any bad news that comes out, citing emails from CDC Director Robert Redfield saying the reports make the president look bad. If you're one of the few flying internationally, you soon won't have to go through a health checkpoint anymore, as Trump plans to order an end to airport screenings, Yahoo! Gina Winter reported. Trump is having a campaign funding crisis, with the president saying he would put in at least $100 million of his own money if he had to, coming on the heels of reporting that Biden and the Democratic National Committee raised about $365 million last month alone, outraising Trump and the RNC by over $150 million. Biden and Trump have been campaigning aggressively this past week as the race is on, with Biden and Trump visiting battleground states all throughout the week. The two candidates will be campaigning while a record number of Americans go vote before Election Day, according to a Washington Post University Maryland poll. According to that survey, 6 in 10 registered voters say they want to vote before November 3rd, a change from 4 in 10 by in 2016. 
Trump is trailing in most polls commissioned, and voters trust Biden on almost everything except the economy, with Trump having a slight lead in that area. The Pentagon plans to order a troop drawdown in Iraq, from 5,200 to 3,000 by the end of September, as well as a yet unknown number in Afghanistan. General Frank McKenzie, commander of U.S. Central Command in charge of the Middle Eastern Theater, said that attacks on U.S. troops in Iraq have increased in an interview with NBC News. The Afghan government and the Taliban have started peace negotiations on Saturday with the potential to put an end to years of U.S. presence in the area. Trump said he hadn't seen any proof of the Navalny poisoning. So I don't know exactly what happened. I think it's, a, it's tragic. It's terrible. It shouldn't happen. Uh, we haven't had any proof yet, but I, I will take a look. Uh, Alexei Navalny is Russia's biggest political opposition figure, and he was allegedly poisoned with the chemical Novichok in his tea on a plane. Russian doctors said Navalny was not poisoned, but Germany took Navalny in, diagnosing his poisoning. Reporting shows that there is a continued pattern of Trump fawning over Putin. Leaked notes of calls between the former British Prime Minister Theresa May and President Trump about the poisoning of Russian dissident Sergei Skripal shows Trump saying, I would rather follow than lead, in response to May's request to punishing Russia. Navalny came out of a coma on Sunday and his status is said to have improved. A whistleblower came forward this week, senior Department of Homeland Security official Brian Murphy, who revealed that intelligence and security assessments on Russia and white nationalists were ordered stopped in May by Acting Homeland Security Secretary Chad Wolf and Deputy Acting Secretary Ken Cuccinelli, respectively, who they in turn were ordered by White House National Security Ro Advisor Robert O'Brien. The federal government keeps going after Russian agents who were and are involved with interfering in U.S. elections, however. The Treasury Department designated Andrei Derkach for sanctions for attempting to send anti-Biden material to Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and other Republican lawmakers. Three other Russians were sanctioned. A separate investigation by the Daily Beast also showed that Russian trolls tried posing as journalists to write for publications such as Jacobin, Truthout, and These Times, all leftist outlets. Two right-wing Norwegian lawmakers have nominated President Trump for the Nobel Peace Prize, one for helping normalize relations between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, and another for trying to help reconcile North and South Korea, despite those efforts going nowhere. Israel and Bahrain are set to normalize relations next, according to announcement by Trump himself. Trump's former personal attorney turned felon, Michael Cohen, wrote a book titled Disloyal. One of the excerpts that came out talked about how the president said his supporters would think it's cool that I slept with a porn star and that he paid Stormy Daniels a lot less than I would have to pay Melania. Cohen pleaded guilty to eight criminal charges including tax evasion, false statements to a financial institution, willfully causing an unlawful corporate contribution, and making an excessive campaign contribution at the request of a candidate referring to paying off Stormy Daniels and model Karen McDougal to hush their affairs with Trump during the 2016 presidential election. A federal prosecutor who worked on the Bill Barr-initiated probe looking into whether the Trump-Russia investigation was corrupted had resigned, citing political pressure from the Attorney General to produce a report before it was completed with due diligence. Nora Danahy sent her resignation over email with no explanation for leaving, but her colleagues told the Hartford Courant the probe, led by U.S. Attorney John Durham, faces signs of political coercion to produce a report before the election. The Veteran Affairs Secretary Robert Wilkie is said to have taken part in talks with President Trump to replace Defense Secretary Mark Esper if Trump fires Esper, according to four senior administration officials to NBC News. Several boats sunk this week during a Trump boat parade. No injuries were reported. The episode was played over broadcast news this week. Dozens of voters tried to show their support for President Trump in boat parades across four states. But in Texas, that parade ended after some of the boats began sinking. The flotilla of Trump supporters gathered on, Lake Travis, on the Lake Travis Reservoir just outside of Austin on Saturday. Officials say the choppy waters generated by the large amounts of boats caused four boats to sink and others to crash into rocks. It's not clear how many boats were on the lake at that time, but more than 8,000 people responded to the Facebook post advertising the event. Fortunately, no one was seriously hurt. USPS Postmaster Louis DeJoy used to reimburse his workers for donations made to the Republican Party when he was running his logistics company, a possible violation of federal election rules, a complaint alleges. The Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington filed a complaint against DeJoy with the Federal Elections Commission. Russell Vaught, the director of the Federal Office of Management and Budget, notified agencies in a memo on September 4th that federal offices are not allowed to conduct divisive anti-American propaganda training, 
such as race theory and white privilege. The memo came after a Fox segment with Tucker Carlson, alleging that agencies were indoctrinating federal workers with Marxist rhetoric. Seema Verna, Trump's official in charge of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, charged taxpayers for a series of PR-related events, Politicals Dan Diamond and Adam Kankren reported. Three examples were a girls' night event thrown in Verna's honor for $2,933, $977 to a consultant for placing an op-ed on Fox News' website, and a $13,000 charge for promoting Verna's receipt of awards and appearances on panels. The Labor Department released more information on jobless claims, showing that unemployment claims have remained steady at around 884,000. Forecasters expected 850,000 claims. 13.4 million Americans are still on unemployment programs. Moving on to Congress, Republican representatives and senators are both clinging to a conspiracy theory that coronavirus numbers are inflated. Senators Ernst and Representative Marshall cite a report that states only 1,000 deaths are solely attributable to COVID, but ignore that more than 190,000 people have died as a result of COVID-complicated conditions. In the House of Representatives, aid to state and local governments are seen as hampering COVID relief talks. You may recall that the CARES Act, which included a one-time $1,200 payment to individuals, $600 a week unemployment insurance, loans to small businesses, and more, expired back in July. The House had passed a replacement measure three months before exp expiration, but the Senate never took on a bill. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, and the President's Chief of Staff Mark Meadows have been negotiating a replacement relief bill, with the President's staff asking for a trillion-dollar bill and the Democrats asking initially for close to $3.5 trillion. The Democrats lowered their ask to $2 trillion, but Republicans wouldn't budge. Now, it seems another big hang-up is aid to state and local governments. Republicans are pitching $120 billion, while Democrats want $900 billion. Congress came back into session on September 8th. Meanwhile, J.P. Morgan Chase had found evidence of employees and customers misusing the Paycheck Protection Program, which are the loans given to small businesses in order to continue paying people on their payroll. The Department of Justice brought 50 cases against those who have abused the relief programs. The House is poised to move forward with the Moore Act, which legalizes marijuana on the federal level. It's a policy change that has been long awaited for this moment, and the Senate, however, is not expected to take up the measure. Critics say that it might be a wrong time to bring forward this legislation, especially in a time when most people are struggling in the COVID crisis. The Congressional Black Caucus is bracing itself for upheaval from the progressive flank. Political Sarah Ferris and Heather Cagle report that with the deaths of John Lewis and Elijah Cummings, and with the victories of Jamal Bowman and Cory Bush, the historical CBC will start to reform itself on a left direction. Last time, we covered a controversial health and human services contract for $250 million for the purpose of painting the pandemic in a positive light. Three chairmen of separate oversight committees, Democrats Maloney, Clyburn, and Christian Morthy, called on the Trump administration to pause the contract so that they can investigate the contract itself. In the Senate, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell moved forward in his attempts to place a $500 billion COVID relief bill on the floor of the Senate, despite not having enough votes to move the measure out of debate as not enough Democrats support the move, saying the bill is completely inadequate compared to the reality of the moment. The bill would have given $300 a week unemployment aid, money for small businesses, COVID testing and schools, liability protections for businesses accused of getting workers sick, and tax credits to help students go to private schools, leaving out $1,200 checks, state and local government aid, and the measure itself is lower than the president's own negotiating team's ask. The effort was defeated by Senate Democrats 52 to 47. Sabado's crystal ball projects that if the Democrats win in November, the Senate will be split 50-50 with a potential Democratic VP being the tiebreaker. Homeland Security Committee Chairman Ron Johnson requested that the Department of Justice Inspector General look into whether Special Counsel Mueller's team deleted official records from their agency phones. It's official agency policy to wipe sensitive data from agency phones before returning them. Testimonies in investigations led by Senators Warren and Casey Jr. about the USPS showed that mail slowdowns led to delays in medicine deliveries since the spring. Moving on to federal judicial news, U.S. District Court Judge Lucy Coe in the Northern District of California ruled that the census shouldn't be winding down while a different case about the census ending early had its hearing on September 17. The Census Bureau instituted a last-minute change to stop counting the population on September 30th instead of October 31st. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court released a redacted ruling from December, which showed it approved warrantless surveillance rules, but said the FBI committed widespread violations of rules meant to protect Americans' privacy. 
U.S. D.C. District Court Judge Reggie Walton warned Trump officials that if they did not finish their review of special counsel Robert Mueller's memos for release to CNN and BuzzFeed News by October 9th, he'll drag them into a hearing to explain the delay. The Department of Justice requested to intervene in a New York State case and represent President Trump in a suit filed against him by E. Jean Carroll, an advice columnist who claimed Trump raped her in the changing room of a department store two decades ago. Carroll sought to depose the president, and this move by the DOJ delays the case until after the election, as well as making it harder for Carroll to win damages against the president. The DOJ reasoned they could represent Trump because the president denied Carroll's charges as president himself. Attorney General Bill Barr defended the move, saying that this sort of intervention was normal, and it's done frequently. The case law is very clear, uh, and there's a D.C. Circuit case called Ballinger on the topic uh, that says that uh, because we are a representative democracy, officials who are elected and answer press questions while they're in office, even if those questions relate to their personal activity uh, and could bear upon their personal fitness, uh, is in fact in the course of federal employment and can be uh, therefore certified uh, under the Westfall Act. This was a normal application of the law. The law is clear. Uh, it is done frequently. Uh, and uh, the little tempest that's going on is, is largely because uh, of the bizarre political environment in which we live and the, uh, you know, the, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. Trump promised weeks ago that he would provide more names to his list of choices to replace any one of the justices on the Supreme Court, which included Senators Ted Cruz and Tom Cotton. The 11th Circuit Court of Appeals in Atlanta ruled that felons in Florida who still owe the state fines and fees cannot register to vote disenfranchising hundreds of thousands of people who just got the right to vote in an election after serving the prison sentences. The deadline to register to vote in Florida is October 5th. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis was the one to oppose the idea, while supporters say that barring people from voting because of a fine they owe amounts to a poll tax. The state supported felon reenfranchisement following a ballot referendum. We close out with very depressing national news on the wildfires happening on the West Coast. The western United States is overrun by record wildfires, with California battling its second to fourth largest forest fires in history. There are about 40 wildfires raging in California alone, with 12 other states fighting fires, spanning a total of 4,200 square miles. 24 deaths have been linked to the wildfires, and entire communities have been wiped out. A report by CNN shows that in addition to obstacles getting more firefighters to assist in battling the wildfires, 911 dispatchers are constantly trying to handle calls from QAnon believers saying that Antifa members are setting fires. This is not true. This ends our week's review of the news. We close out by reminding viewers to register to vote, fill out your census forms if you haven't already, rate, review, and share this podcast with your friends. Become a patron today on Patreon.com. And if you have any recommendations, you can always message us on any social media platforms that you find us. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, you name it. Thanks for listening and have a great weekend.